Coming up on Garden Talk. Water temperature and environment temperature is critical for this plant, especially during this rooting stage. You need that higher, warmer temperature to encourage the root growth. I like to keep a rooting hormone in my SOPs every time. There's definitely three stages of rooting. The first is callus, the next is uh, striking, and the third is uh, searching. You know, in theory, if your plants are green to begin with and they turn purple, um, in your rooting stage, yeah, you gotta adjust what you're feeding and what you're saturating your trays with, and more than likely, you gotta you gotta match what that plant previously was getting. Start reading the backs of labels of products and bottles. What the actual active ingredient is. Feed what the mother plant you cut from was being fed. You don't want to change it up. What's up everybody, few that don't know me, my name is Chris, AKA Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 60. In this episode, I interview Paul, also known as Clone Coach. He has been gardening for 10 years and offers online clone coaching. He'll also be launching a nursery marketplace for licensed cultivators in California. In this episode, he talks all about how to be successful when cloning plants. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to Gorilla Grow Tent for sponsoring this episode. Gorilla is well known for their quality grow tents. They have a super strong frame, thick canvas density, and a height adjusting roof. It comes with a one foot extension kit and a two foot extension kit is optional so you can grow even taller plants. They also have the light line, same quality as the original Gorilla Grow Tents but with a few key design changes. Go to their website growstrongindustries.com and use discount code MrGrowIt for 15% off. A big supporter of this podcast is AC Infinity. They sponsor this podcast and I use their products. AC Infinity now has gardening tools and accessories such as heavy duty fabric grow pots, trimmers, grow room glasses, drying racks, plant ties, and trellis nets. They also have all of the equipment needed for a ventilation system. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code Mr. Grow It during checkout for a discount on their products. All right, we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Paul, the clone coach. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Um, so Paul is an expert when it comes to cloning. So I figured I'd base this episode around that. Um, there's so many different ways to clone and it can be a bit challenging at times to get clones to successfully root, depending on the method that's used. So I really want this episode to reveal some good best practices that will help the listeners be successful cloning. Uh, but before we get into cloning that deep, um, let's do an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've I've been gardening since kind of like my late teens, you know, as a hobby. Just plants always interested interested me. Um, you know, I started back in the day just by kind of getting seeds from chilies and stuff that we were eating and, you know, propagating them, germinating them, and then um, putting them in uh, little pots and stuff and growing that same plant and eating peppers that we had for dinner. So kind of showing the rest of the family, hey, you know, all these seeds that are inside could become other plants. Um, so just had a hobby gardens, you know, growing up and stuff, but always had a, a love and a passion for for plants in general. And um, yeah, you know, early in my career, I was traveling a lot, so I couldn't have a garden because I was always gone. So I was kind of always, uh, you know, kind of in the back of my head. But finally, when I um, you know, stop traveling for work. I was able to, you know, garden a lot more. So it's it's always a good passion. It's good therapy, and I encourage others to do it. Awesome, good stuff there. Um, so let's get into just some basic questions to begin. I yeah. do have another cloning episode on this podcast. Uh, if anybody's interested, we get real deep into the process, kind of step by step on how to take clones. I believe if you search my name, Mister Grow It, and then clones or how to take clones it should pop up it's with trey strongs from cltv in this episode right here we won't go over the the beginner type details uh, but it will certainly involve a lot of the details needed in order to be successful in various ways um, the first question i have for you is 
why is it important to take clones from a healthy mother plant? It's everything, really. Um, you know, the, the importance of it is uh, that the fact that the mother plant and your clones, they go hand in hand. So anything that your mother plant is experiencing, good or bad, you're going to show it in your clones. So, you know, clones, you always want to have the best start possible because your, your, your crop is essentially riding on that. So taking clones from the healthiest mother plants being, you know, un, you know no stress, no environmental stress, you know, fully acclimated to their environment, fully fed nutrient wise, you know, no deficiencies. Um, that's going to give you the best possible product in the next stage. So, you know, cl cloning from a healthy mother plant is is vital and it's it's the first step to producing the best possible stock you can so if you do take if you do happen to have a, a plant that is showing a sign of deficiencies maybe you're starting mm -hmm. to see nitrogen deficiency to begin mm -hmm. um, and you can't wait around you got to take those cuts that day um, can the person still be successful is that clone still going to root so on and so forth and, and if that clone could recover and then turn out to be a usable plant or do you just totally recommend that the plant has to be 100% healthy in order to take clones off? You know, if if life is uh, working against you, you have to cut off of that plant when it's not in the best stage possible. You got to do what you got to do, right? Rooting is one half or one portion of creating, uh, you know, a proper clone. Um, so the, the plant can still root if it's a bit deficient. Now, the top half of that plant, the stem and the new growth and the leaves are going to show its deficiency a lot more. So you can get the plant to root, but you're gonna take a lot more time, an extra week, two weeks, to bring that plant health back up to a stage to where it's acceptable to move on to the next stage. So usually if that's the case, you'll have roots on the bottom, but as you move up the stem, you'll go from green to purple, to purple, darker purple, and then your inner nodes are gonna be really tightly spaced and there's really not a lot of developed growth when it comes to your new leaves or anything like that. So it can root, you know, this plant's amazing, it will root, but you will suffer as far as your, your canopy and your leaves and uh, your structure goes. So, you know, take that in mind. Okay, that makes sense. And we'll definitely get into purple and red stems later on in the episode. That's that's a question I have slated for that because I know that's a common question. But first, uh, the tips on the cutting process. I know this is a very broad question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but kind of to narrow it down a little bit, is there a certain time to take cuttings? Like does the plant need to be a certain height, for example? Uh, and then what part of the plant? I heard that uh, you know there's differences between taking cuttings from the bottom part of the plant versus the top part of the plant. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I mean, some good rule, rules of thumb. I mean, you want to take cuttings off of a plant that's been growing for, I say, about 14 days, undisturbed. Undisturbed meaning no topping, no pinching, no bending. Um, you just want that growth to, to be undisturbed for a good 12 to 14 days before you cut that growth, um, which is, you know, nine times out of 10 going to be off the top of the plant, right beneath your lights if you're in an indoor setting. Um, you know, cloning from the bottom of the plant in the indoor setting, it's not getting direct light. So your, your, your stems are going to be a lot thinner. Um, you know, your plants are not going to be as developed and is not as, not as hardy. Once again, it can and will root, but your clone is going to be just a little bit weaker, a little bit, you know, behind everything else. Not as, not used to the intensity of the light and the food and kind of the, the rapid activity happening inside the plant. So it's best recommended to have your plant grow for about 14 days, take off uh, the growth that's been growing right underneath the lights there, and um, have as, me as much um, cross-contamination practices in mind. So you want to have clean scissors um, or clean scalpel, clean razor blade, clean anything. Um, and when I say clean, you want to use products um, that actually get rid of viroids and viruses and anything like that. Viroid being like the main thing nowadays. And then, you know, alcohol doesn't kill the viroid, um, you know, according to all of these studies and everything that, that are being done. So, you know, an easy product that everybody has access to is bleach. 10% bleach, um, you know, a 30 second to one minute uh, dwell time is about what they recommend. Um, so not a quick dip and a rinse. There actually has to be a dwell time on the surface of your tools um, in between plants and stuff. So cut off the new healthy growth 
and keep clean uh, tools to, to make those cuts off your plant. So you're saying isopropyl alcohol, which is very, very common that people use to very. sterilize their equipment. You're saying that's not sufficient. It's not sufficient as far as a viroid goes, being hoplite and viroid, which is a, ma a really big concern um, in a lot of commercial grows nowadays. So, I mean, it's good for other practices, but, you know, generally speaking, too, if we take a step back, you need to wash a surface before you sanitize the surface. So if the surface has debris or already has plant material on it or has any buildup on it and you just dip it into alcohol or anything else, you're not getting to the surface of that tool. So alcohol takes you so far, but a clean surface and the right product will guarantee you better success as far as your tools go. That makes sense. So after you take that cutting, right? But I guess size of the cutting is one thing I kind of want to get a little deeper into. Uh, generally okay. speaking, I've heard about six inches at the minimum. Certainly, it'll root with uh, you know smaller than that. It can root larger than that. What's your take on the size of cutting to take? So if you're using traditional domes, uh, humidity domes, that's a seven-inch dome on average. So and you don't want your plant to be touching the top of that dome for 14 days, you know, accumulating humidity and, and condensation on, you know, that fresh growth up top. So you want to be about an inch below that so that, you know, and you're going to plug in your stem into your cloning media about an inch or so. So that um, six inches, you know, an inch goes into the media and you have, um, you know, a couple inches to play with up top. So six could be a little bit short. Um, once you plug it in and, and put it into a tray. So just above that um, six inch mark is kind of where you want to be. And it's going to be dependent on the development of the plant and kind of the, the new nodes and the fan leaves coming off of it. So I like to base it on the, the top nodes and the newest growth down to the bottom of the stem on a nice cutting mat. You know, line my, my new growth there. My stem at the bottom, there's usually a, a 45 degree angle on your cutting mat. Get a nice clean cut and, you know, it's not going to be perfect and that's okay because um, you have a little bit of play within the dome and when you're treating the entire tray as one, as one canopy, a little bit of play, quarter inch here, half inch there is just fine in the grand scheme of things. So just over six inches should, should be perfect for a seven inch dome. So you've sterilized your scissors, you've taken that cutting. Some people will dip it into a rooting hormone, although that's an optional step, right? Is there a particular type of rooting hormone uh, that you recommend? Uh, maybe talk about like liquid versus powder, stuff like that. I've tried. Uh, there's a few out there. There's a handful out there, right? And, you know, there's new um, uh, hormones coming onto the market as well. Um, but they all have that same active ingredient, which is kind of what you want to start reading the backs of labels of products and bottles what the actual active ingredient is uh, in your products and what strength and or percentage um, is in that product. So for rooting hormones, uh, endol, endolburic acid, IBA, and I think there's a few different strains of IBA, um, which I think like a liquid will have one strain or two strains combined. You know, a powder will have, you know, the other one and gels um, have an a endol, endolburic acid as well. My personal favorite is Clonix. It's been around forever um, you know it works I know there's new products out there and I want to give them a shot I want to give side by side and um, you know see how they do some say reading hormones are, are optional but it's just a staple in my SOPs so it's just you want to help trigger um, you know rooting and striking the roots and that's what that hormone does so you know why not give you know the plant everything it needs for that short period of time you're expecting it to do you know a lot of a lot of growing you know creating a callus striking roots creating a root zone you know and all this stuff during the rooting process so i like to keep a rooting hormone in my sops um every time so after you dip into that rooting hormone it could go into a variety of different things right so um you could actually yeah. put it into a cube you could put like a root riot cube is what i'm referring to um, you could put it into rock wool. You could mm -hmm. put it directly into soil or cocoa, which is what I often do. I just do kind of like the lazy man method. I don't want to go and buy the rock wool or cubes. Uh -huh. I just say directly into the soil, do it. It takes a little bit longer to root uh, from my experience, but it still will root under the right conditions. Um, right. Or they skip all that and they just do aeroponics, aeroponic cloner. Um, another broad question for you. Can you talk to us about the differences between those things and how the success rate can vary and so on and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, as a general statement, 
the the environment needs to hold some, um, a certain amount of moisture and a certain amount of oxygen. So that ratio is what the the stem and root zone really needs to to begin its rooting process and to go throughout its rooting process. So as long as there's a good ratio of moisture to oxygen, that's why you know you could do it in cocoa soil and all these different medias, and a plant will strike roots and will grow and will do its thing. So that's kind of the the rule of thumb and what is needed on a basic level. Um, now as far as different methods go, like aeroponics, I used to do that back in the day. Um, but it's a bit finicky. It's, it's like any other aeroponic system or, and or hydroponic system or deep water culture system where if there's any variation in your parameters, you're more than likely going to have issues. So if a timer goes down or if the water chiller is not chilling water or if any issues like that happen, you have very little room for margin for error. So you really need to have, um, you know, close eye on your system to ensure there's no hiccups throughout your your rooting process so it works that moisture to oxygen level gets created in that environment in the aeroponic system but if your temperature is off or uh, anything like that you could have some issues and there's not an easy way to recover from that um, the different types of media rock wool is a traditional one it's been used for who knows how long and it, and it works it works just fine um, and especially if you're going to go into another rock wool cube, that's where you want to start off with. It's a great, it's a great starting point. Um, it's got a good moisture to oxygen ratio. Um, you know, most people squeeze the cubes to, for whatever reason they have in mind, but I don't. I, you know, I say they come from the manufacturer with a certain ratio that they could hold so much moisture and not hold anything more than that. So I don't squeeze any of the rock wool cubes like most people do. Um, any cubes really. Um, Oasis Cubes is like a floral foam, so it's another um, good slab to use, but it's very delicate when it's dry. Like pulling it out of the box, it, it just falls apart when it's dry. It's, it's so delicate. But once it gains moisture and you, moist and you uh, saturate it, it's good to go and it holds its place and stuff. And it's a, it's a good media. Now, there's also the root riots like you mentioned, and I think that's a great option for like hobby growers and or people that aren't doing too much production too often. And I say that because, you know, you still have to manually, um, you know, saturate the cubes and then fill in your 50 cell trays or however many, um, you know, cells you're doing in a tray. You have to manually plug all of those individual cubes. On a small scale, it's not a big deal. But when you're doing commercial scale, that's a lot of labor that is wasted. Um, so on a commercial scale, my personal favorite are the iHort trays. Um, the Excel trays to, you know, narrow it down. They got a few products, but those come pre-filled. So that 50 cell tray comes pre-filled with a cocoa, cocoa peat base media with a little bit of perlite and um, some, some just way to keep it, keep it compact. So when it, you could break it down like soil, but it holds its, its shape when it's in the cube and it's in the tray and stuff. So that's my personal favorite because it comes pre-filled and you save a ton of labor when it comes to the commercial scale. So you could you could clone and root in most in most medias. Um, just just gotta work with that ratio of moisture and uh, dry backs and oxygen and stuff to encourage the root growth. Yeah, I know temperature is another thing that kind of you gotta keep an eye on, particularly in in soil uh, or cocoa is primarily like I mentioned what I clone in. Or stick my mm -hmm. clones into i've had issues where i didn't really monitor the temperature it was too low you know what i mean and it was on the ground and it just it wasn't high enough temperature in that medium in order to promote the growth um, right. so that the plants started to die off you could see the leaves started to become yellow and then uh, and then i went and put a heat mat on it common thing that people use heat mat underneath it um, and then it recovered you know all it needed was just heat that's it Yep. So uh, heat mat is another thing worth mentioning that uh, if you're having Absolutely. trouble getting that uh, the temperature to where it needs to be, heat mat is definitely uh, something to look into. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't recommend, you know, throwing the tray on the floor just because it's the coldest spot in the room, especially if it's like a concrete floor or something like that. It's the coldest spot and it's, and it's the closest to your root zone or where you're trying to create a root zone. Hence, you know, the issues you just described will, will definitely happen, you know. Um, so, you know, keeping it elevated off the ground, 
you know, getting a, a good, you know, temperature is critical. Um, you know, water temperature and environment temperature is critical for this plant, especially during this rooting stage. You need that higher, warmer temperature to encourage the root growth and, um, you know, get that root zone to get, get activated. So. so the rooting process, it's three stages. I was doing some digging on your YouTube uh, channel and uh, saw our video that you talk about the three stages of rooting. Can you talk to us about That's that? Correct. Yeah, there's definitely three stages of rooting. The first is callus, the next is uh, striking, and the third is uh, searching. So, and the callus stage happens in the first few days of the rooting process. And essentially your stem is gonna form a callus. It's gonna, you're gonna see thick, um, almost scaly, bumpy uh, growth come off of your stem. And that's the first stage, and that's where that um, rooting hormone helps aid in this process as well but it's going to create that first callus stage. So your stem's going to form, um, you know, callus all around that. And you'll notice sometimes too, like if you cut off of a, a fan leaf or something like that, and you, you leave a wound, that it'll start to form a callus there too, if the environment's right, because the plants just want to form and do that um, stage. From the callus, you're going to strike roots. And these are just tiny little nubs that are just like little spikes, like a little just little spikes coming off this callus that are just beginning that root striking stage. And that happens um, between like days four and seven, um, kind of the middle stage of, of rooting. And um, after the striking stage is a searching stage and is essentially where you're creating your root zone. So you're, encourage, you're, you're encouraging the root growth and searching to, to show the roots a bit more in the root ball by uh, by doing these drybacks and by reducing moisture levels so that the roots are forced to search for water and in doing so they're displaying themselves they're creating a bigger root zone and they're out there actively searching for water um you know coming in contact with the root inoculant that's in your slabs coming in contact with the nutrients and that's what will get you through your your process a lot better so there's three stages of rooting. And if you're having any issues with rooting and you tear apart one of your, your cubes, you could see what stage it made it to or did it make it past. And so with that, you could help diagnose where you're, you're having issues. So if it's not even creating a callus and you know you, you realize, hey, yeah, the temperature was too low and I put this heating mat and all of a sudden it's formed a callus, now it's striking roots, you're able to diagnose where your issues are. Um, if you form the callus and struck roots, but they're just, you just don't see any roots on your cube and, uh, you know, have to break it apart. Now there are some roots where, you know, why aren't they showing on the outside? Well, on the later half, you got to encourage, uh, the roots to search for water. So increase your drybacks, reduce your humidity levels. So that's where you could kind of use those three stages of rooting to help dial in, um, you know, your whole process. So moisture content super important. Um, the initial soaking, I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. Uh, you know, the root riot plugs, some people will, will soak them prior or the rock will they'll soak it prior. And then you mentioned kind of squeezing it out. And how do people dial in that moisture content? And also, I want to wrap pH into this because some people will make sure that water is a certain pH that they're soaking that cube into. Can you talk to us about those right. things? Yeah, with pH, you want to start a little bit lower than general. So if you're feeding your, your plants normally about 6.0 pH and some cocoa or something, you're going to start a, a, a few points below that. So about 5.8 or so. If you're in rock wool, it's kind of the only one that you need to go even lower than that, about 5.6, even 5.5, 5, especially for that initial soak. Um, and it's even recommended on the, on the packaging. So rock wool just starts a little bit lower. Everything else, you just want to be about 5.7, 5.8, just to um, encourage that 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 acid in the rooting hormone and everything to to help the whole process you know strike roots as far as saturation goes i don't like squeezing the the cubes for a few reasons if you squeeze a cube and i squeeze a cube it's going to be different if the third person squeezes a cube it's going to be different again so you need consistency when it comes to producing clones on a mass on a mass scale especially commercially you need consistency it's it's paramount so having someone do something manually eliminates that. Like you, you can't, three people can't do the same thing, you know, and get the same results. And, you know, the, the manufacturers create this product that could hold so much moisture, but 
it can't hold in anything more than that. So, you know, I like to just saturate it completely, 100%. And that's the moisture that it carries on to about halfway through the rooting process. Because you don't need to re-saturate uh, that media or anything like that. Just give it a full saturation with the right levels of nutrients and root inoculants. And that's what will carry you through the first two stages of rooting and then get you into uh, feeding and drying back on the second half of the rooting stage. You said nutrients as well. What nutrients are they is recommended for that? So traditionally, you know, previously for years, everybody fed your, your fed their clones very little food. You're talking 0.5 EC, very, very, very little food because um, the mindset was these are babies. They can't handle a lot of food. You got to give them very little food. And the results that they would get were stunted growth. They would need a week to bounce back after the rooting process. You're creating a deficient plant, essentially. So as far as nutrients go, my rule of thumb is to feed what the mother plant you cut from was being fed. You don't want to change it up. Because if you want the same type of growth that you were getting from that mother plant and that growth was hitting all your check marks, you want the same thing because you're going to put that back in the veg and create another plant that looks just like it. So if you change the food up, well, now this plant has to get used to something different. Maybe it doesn't have everything it needs. Now it's slowing down. So my rule of thumb is whatever the mother plant's being fed, for the initial soak, it's 50%. Half of that. And then get it into that regimen that it was being fed previously. And that's how you'll get the get your clones to look just like the day they were cut. So that's another part of the SOPs is you want your clones to look just like the day they were cut, you gotta mimic that same type of food and environment to get it to, to that point in, in 14 days. Got it, that's good to know. Environment, let's talk about that. Temperature, relative humidity, they certainly have an impact on rooting as well, right? What's the ideal yep. temperature and relative humidity for the cloning process? So we, we start with the mother room. That's going to be about 78 to 80 degrees and about 65% humidity. So a nice, breezy, warm summer day. Um, you want I like to harden my clones off to that environment. So if you could clone in your mother room, that's uh, ideal. You know, you don't always need a separate room with all this extra humidity and a whole new environment. You could use the same environment that the plants came from because when you put that dome on it's going to increase your humidity it's going to increase your temperature and you you're playing you're adjusting this microclimate within this dome in order to encourage you know all these uh, stages of rooting so and then once they're fully done they've been acclimated to the same environment that they came from which is ideal environment for veg so if you know if you're a commercial producer and you're sending it off to another grower well, it's been acclimated to a, a perfect um, veg environment that could go into any other veg environment and thrive. So you don't need to have a big swing of humidity or anything like that. So high 70s, 78, 80, and 65% humidity, um, the environment will, will be perfect for your, for your trays. And then CO2, something that isn't talked about too much when it comes to cloning, but uh, I know there are some concerns from people using domes in particular that they're going to deplete the CO2 within the dome. Is there any, can you give me some thoughts on that and maybe some suggestions on how often they should be opening up the dome or opening up the, the slots in the zone, the dome for aeration purposes? For, for CO2, um, you know, I've never really been concerned about the internal CO2 levels in the dome. Um, you know, feeding CO2 to the mother plant and the mother stock, um, I like to match the PAR levels. So if you're, you know, running some, you know, 630 watt CMHs, It'll give you about you know, five to six hundred, depending on the, the height or the canopy level. Um, and you want to kind of want to match that. So about 600 ppm as well of CO2, nothing too intense. If your humidity, if your temperatures and stuff go up or your light intensity goes up, you could you can increase your CO2 as well for those mother plants. Um, but as far as the domes go in that little environment, I never like to, and I, and I used to do this. I used to, you know, keep the, the little vents closed the first couple of days. And, you know, always through trial and error, I found that's not a best practice. I never want to close that dome 100% um, because I, I've put meters inside these domes to really read the internal environments. And with cracking a dome, you still have plenty of humidity um, that the plant needs during the early stages. 
and yet you're not suffocating it. You're not trapping it. So there's still a little bit of, of, of airflow. And if any excess hot air needs to rise, it has somewhere to leave. So I don't like to keep my, my vents closed at all for any period of time, really. Um, it's not something I encourage or recommend. Okay. I personally live in a very dry climate. Uh, I live in the desert, like I mentioned. I live in, currently live in Las Vegas, and it gets super dry here. Uh, 26% is what I'm seeing right now on my meter, so very, very dry. Um, now, when I go to clone, I do use the domes to increase that mm -hmm. humidity in that grow space. Um, and when I do have those vents open, it like gets rid of everything and my humidity drops. What would you say is like the lowest humidity that you can successfully get rooting to happen? I mean, I feel you as far as the dry the dry weather goes. I'm down in Palm Springs and we're we're, you know, 10, 20 percent humidity. It's it's ridiculous. You know, my sinuses feel it all the time and stuff, too. Um, but, you know, if you're in an environment that the, that the mother plants are in, you know, you got some humidity there. But within the dome, if you have a full canopy within the dome, those plants will transpire, especially with the moisture as well in the cubes that will transpire and give you enough humidity to to fill up your your dome worth of humidity without having to spray the dome or, you know, be able to crack the the domes and still hold humidity. So if you're and when I say open, I don't mean, you know, all the way initially, you know, just, you know, quarter the way, just make sure it's not 100 percent closed. But if you're still re losing all of you, your humidity, I would look at how much, uh, how many, how much plant material you have in your tray. Is it a full tray? Is it half a tray? Because if it's a full tray and a fully saturated slab, and the, the vents are cracked slightly, you should hold, you should create enough moisture within that dome, um, you know, to to do that. So I would just say, you know, fill up your tray as much as you can, with as much plant material, and that should help you there. And if you have to close your domes. 100% because it's just not holding um, not you don't want to keep it closed for more than you know 24 hours you want to still exchange that air burp the dome you want to let those plants breathe and get some fresh oxygen get some fresh uh, co2 and and get rid of the the stagnant and stale uh, condensation and humidity that's being built up gotcha that makes sense and then lighting for clones. I think there's some common misconceptions about lighting for clones. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that. When do the clones need light? How much light? So on and so forth. Um, I like to keep them on a 24-hour schedule. Um, you know, you can do 18-6 like, like you do your normal veg plants. But what I don't like about that is during those six hours, you've just changed the internal parameters of your dome. You've increased humidity, you've reduced temperature because you're not getting a little bit of ambient temperature from the light. Um, so you're, you're changing your parameters within your dome for you know a third of the day um, throughout, throughout the entire process. So for lighting, keep the lights on 24 hours a day. That's my recommendation. And four foot um, you know, LEDs or, or you know, LED lights, you know, a couple of them on a four by two tray, you could house four trays on there, six to eight inches above the, the, the dome. It should be spot on, um, and that should be enough light to create the environment you want within the dome. And then when the domes come off, they could still veg underneath their light, still intense enough to to get some vegetative growth um, if they have to sit for the weekend or, or so, something like that. So for lighting, you could go as, as easy as something off of Amazon, four foot LEDs, and you know start there, or you could go uh, uh, get some Lux LED um, four foot lights as well. Um, I don't personally like like the purple um, lights. I've, I've tried them and I just didn't get the same growth that I wanted out of them. Um, so a cool blue spectrum is is what I prefer versus like a deep red or anything like that. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Let's get into some of the problems that can happen. Purple stems, red stems, talked about that in the beginning of the episode. Let's circle back and, and get into that. What do purple or red stems mean, and how do you get them back to green? You know, if if they started green, and they went to purple, you didn't you didn't feed strong enough in your rooting stage. So, if your mother plants were purple to begin with, you're not feeding strong enough there. So it's just going to extrapolate that problem in the rooting process. So, you know, in theory, if your plants are green to begin with and they turn purple. 
um, in your rooting stage, yeah, you gotta adjust what you're feeding and what you're saturating your trays with. And more than likely, you gotta you gotta match what that plant previously was getting, and that should that should address your problems. Um, and there's some purple strains that are just you know genetically a bit more purple stems, and that's why I said if they start purple and that still met all of your other uh, you know parameters as far as just being a healthy plant, then that's just you know a purple stem genetic, and it shouldn't be anything to worry about. Um, but it's it's usually just a deficiency. Um, if you're also getting like yellow growth on your new newly developed leaves, like stunted yellow growth, that's usually micronutrients, usually iron um, and zinc and things like that. So, you know, up your CalMag, 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 right? Um, up those micronutrients and it should address that, that stunted uh, growth as well. So, you know, because purple stem, you're more than likely going to also have the stunted growth as well up top, that, that short inner node space that um, underdeveloped leaf and um, you know the yellowing and in your in your leaves as well so they usually go hand in hand which just means that these plants are hungry these plants are hungry you're, you're, you're babying them too much up the light up the food and and get them to uh, get that root zone to start up taking all those nutrients and give it a little bit of time and it'll bounce right back a lot, i think a lot of people don't know that the calmag does often i can't speak for all of them but there are a lot of calmag formulas that include iron for example, or include some iron of the well, yeah. macronutrients. So you mentioned that those could potentially be, I'm sorry, micronutrients. So those could potentially be the cause for it. So yeah, when you mentioned CalMag, that's uh, just wanted to mention that point as well. Yeah, definitely. Iron is, I was trying to think of it when I was speaking, but it, it slipped my mind. But yeah, that iron and, and um, will definitely address all of that and you know should, should get rid of your purple stems and your yellow growth, which you... You shouldn't accept, really. Once again, if your plant stock to begin with was healthy and green and getting everything that it needs, you really shouldn't accept the fact that your plants are turning purple or yellow in the rooting process. It's just not necessary. What are some common mistakes that growers make when cloning? Some common mistakes, they uh, they just kind of let it cook, right? They, they uh, you know, close the domes up, let that humidity increase, and they just want to they want to give it too much humidity on their own by spraying the domes, keeping them closed, you know, not touching them for, for days on end. That's a big mistake, right? And it's like they, they assume that this plant needs 100% humidity for five days straight, and it just doesn't. And that's, that's a huge mistake, and you'll start getting all of the pathogen issues. You'll get stem rot. You have your leaves falling over. And then when you start to acclimate them to, you know, your normal reduced humidity environment, you're gonna get a bunch of stressed out plants. Your leaves are gonna curl up. It's just not gonna be, it's not gonna like the big shock in humidity. So, you know, that's that's a big issue that, that uh, most growers, you know, do. So I like to reduce my humidity gradually, not start it too high, once again, never 100%, and we acclimate it down to that, uh, you know, mother room environment, that 60, 65% humidity. And, you know, with those, um, at a certain stage, daily burps, so you're removing that dome, you're wiping off the excess humidity, and you're, you're putting that dome back on, and that shouldn't be more than, you know, 15, 30 seconds. If you're taking your domes off for minutes on end, especially in the first few days, it's another big mistake. It's just, there's just, they haven't developed the root zone to hold that moisture, drink that moisture up yet. So earlier on, you want to take off your domes for a very small amount of time, but you still need to burp those domes and get rid of the excess moisture from your domes. Later on, you could leave them off for a little bit longer because they've already got some roots and they're already uh, being acclimated a bit more to the environment. So that's a big mistake. Just, just uh, you know, don't give them too much moisture in the beginning. Just let, let the plants breathe. Let the plants breathe. So if clones aren't rooting, what are some of the things that growers should look for or do? Um, I mean, you got to take a step back and look at your environment first, right? Um, you know, trust but verify all your sensors. Um, you could even get small sensors that go inside the domes and really see what's happening within your dome. Um, look at your, your, your temperature, your uh, saturation of your media as well, your procedures. Um, you got to really look at everything. There's not too many aspects to cloning, but the aspects that are there are, are very critical. And you have to be consistent with every step. So if you're getting inconsistent results and you have a team of three, four, five people cutting and plugging, 
you should really go one on one with them and just and, and watch and observe and see if they're really following all the SOPs or if someone's taking a shortcut or someone left some plants out, you know, during lunchtime for just too much time and all these little things that kind of come in mind when managing a team, uh, you know, in a nursery. The cross contamination problem that you spoke about before is uh, something that can really, really do some damage. You know, especially when you're working on one of these commercial facilities. I mean, I've seen pictures where a person uses the same pair of scissors, for example, and all of a sudden they cut clones for a thousand plants, and those thousand plants had a virus or a viroid, and so they look like complete crap. And that's a lot of plants to mess up, right? When you're looking at thousands of plants, hundreds of plants, or thousands of plants. It could do some serious damage there. Yep. Talking about cross-contamination a little bit more, you had something on your Instagram, which I wanted to bring up here, which is you have a solution, uh, particularly for the hormone gels to prevent co- cross-contamination. Can you talk about that solution? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so tradi- traditionally, uh, when, when plugging clones, most people have always gotten a shot class, filled that up with a rooting gel, and had that uh, you know by their side as they're grabbing the stem, dipping it into the shot glass with gel and plugging it into your tray. But what that's doing is creating one one central point for all of your stems to cross contaminate and just if there's any issues with one plant, it's being cross contaminated against everything. So, you know, taking a step back, just just kind of getting creative and say, you know, what could be the solution? What's the problem? The problem is they're sharing that same cup, that same gel and you got multiple mother plants and stuff. So, what's the solution? Well, we still need gel on the stems right we don't we can't share them but uh you know just in 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 racking my brain and brainstorming a little bit i came up with a a a solution that i'd put the gel inside of a ketchup bottle a squeeze ketchup bottle and all of the the cells and the trays have uh, pre-made holes for your stems so that fit perfectly for the squeeze bottle so i just give it a little squeeze and i am filling up the the cubes the cube holes the stem holes with the gel versus uh, sharing a cup and dipping everything individually in that shared cup. So now that stem doesn't share anything else. It goes right into its own cube with its own gel and doesn't share anything else. And you repeat the process and all of a sudden you're not sharing the gel anymore. So it's it's critical for when like you know you have an issue or you, you know, you're, you're suspected of having a viroid issue or anything that's really transferable uh, physically, which that gel will just house all of that. So that ketchup bottle tech, whatever, you know, whatever we want to call it here, it's, it's, uh, it works and it's enough to like create, you know, uh, a new solution and, you know, that may trigger a different solution or something else in the future, but for now it solves a problem as far as sharing that cup of gel, right? It solves that problem. That's a really cool solution. I'm glad you shared that with us today because, uh, First time I've ever seen it. Previously, you know, you'd always pour fresh and you never reuse. You never pour back into the bottle. It was like, hey, I'm doing good, right? I'm not I'm not reusing gel and stuff. But it's like you had to, you know, when you're in a facility and stuff, you have to get creative and you have to uh, be cost efficient too. I mean, a, a squeeze ketchup bottle on Amazon is a couple bucks. I mean, and, and as far as time goes, you know, I was talking to the, the staff that I previously managed and it was it was easy. It wasn't too much of a, a, a burden on them as far as procedures go, time goes, labor goes. It's a quick step. They're doing 50, squeeze, 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 squeeze. You know, a couple minutes later, boom, they're rocking. And it saves them it saves them a bit of time. And quite honestly, it, it's it's better because once you, uh, once that, that cup of gel gets used a little bit, it's kind of, you know, stems are coming from liquid. So there's always a little bit of liquid on the bottom of the stems that goes into the gel. And that doesn't allow the gel to cling onto your stem very well. So you have to put more gel that's drier so it clings to your stem. So that solves that problem as well. Because once you bring in a little bit of moisture into this gel cup, the, the, the effectiveness of that gel clinging to your stem is like almost nil. Cleaner, faster, safer. Cheaper, yeah. It's like, And some people were like, oh, you know, it looks like you're using too much gel and stuff. Look, that's, that's an easy adjustment, right? And if you pour and I pour, you know, into the, the same thing, we may be a little bit different, but that's an easy adjustment you can make for all the benefits you gain that we just described. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to buy a ketchup bottle or two. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So kind of getting towards the end of the podcast here, we went over a lot, a lot of good tips. Talk to us. How can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Instagram, I try to be active on there as, uh, as much as I can. So uh, Clung Coach on Instagram. 
Uh, my YouTube channel is barely getting its, its wheels moving. Um, I'm learning how to do all this video recording, editing, you know, script writing. It's, it's a lot to take on, but uh, it's something that I have on my agenda. So on YouTube, uh, Clone Coach as well. And, um, you know, so I offer a rooting program and clone coaching. So, you know, in the nursery end of things from a commercial scale, you know, I've been cutting, plugging and selling clones since 2015. So I, I understand the managing aspect, the production aspect, um, you know, the market aspect and everything else. So, you know, that clone coach program will get you the best clones ever in 14 days. Um, and in the future, uh, for the licensed California market, I do have a nursery marketplace in the works. So... Um, that, that should be coming up fairly soon, and I will be excited to, uh, to reach back out and talk a bit more about that. That's exciting. And that's really cool that you offer one-on-one -on -one consulting. I was on your website and, and saw that. I know a lot of people mm -hmm. don't offer that, but that's really cool that you do. So if anybody who is tuning into this is looking for consulting, definitely uh, check out his website, and you can sign up for that. So Awesome. Well, thanks, Paul. I appreciate you coming on. Click the thumbs up if you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast, so stay tuned. I would love for you to tune into future episodes. And yeah, thanks so much, Paul. We will uh, leave it. I, I appreciate you having me on here. This was this was a blast. And uh, yeah, let's uh, anybody out there struggling with their clones, let's get you some results. Sounds good. All right. Until next time. Peace out, everyone.